here uh, this evening. Uh, I want the Lord to have his way and minister to us here tonight. So if you turn with me to Haggai, the second chapter, starting at the fifth verse, the Bible says, according to the word that I covenanted with you, when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Can we trust the Lord tonight? I think he's proven to us time and time again that we can trust him tonight. We can put our confidence in him because he will not fail us and he will not let us down. But not only will he not fail us, the word here says that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Church, this evening, do we realize that the Lord has covenanted himself with us that his spirit will remain with his people? Yes. It's not just that we have to walk through this life alone. God hasn't failed us yet, but it's not just the fact that he hasn't failed us yet. His spirit remains with us. His spirit will go with us to encourage us. His spirit will go with us to lead us, to guide us, to give us the direction that we need for our everyday path. Because his covenant is forevermore. It will not be broken. There's a difference between a covenant and a promise. A covenant is something that is kept no matter what may happen. If I covenant something with you, it doesn't matter what you do along the way. It doesn't matter what happens along the way. I have to keep that covenant or else I'm a liar. You see, a promise normally comes along with some kind of deal. It comes along because I say, well, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. We can see in the Bible there are many, many promises that God gave the people. In fact, most everything throughout the Bible is a promise because the way the Lord gives it to us, the way the Lord works it out and he words it is a if then, if you will humble myself or humble yourselves and seek my face, then I will heal your lands. That's the way God does so many things throughout the Bible is he gives us promises. But in this situation, God did not just give his people a promise. He covenanted with them that his spirit should remain with his people. Church today, it's not a promise that God has given to us. It's not a conditional agreement that we have to hold up our end of the bargain for his spirit to remain with us. He has covenanted himself to be with us. Amen. Now, Brother Christopher, does that mean we can do whatever we want to do? That does not mean we can do whatever we want to do. There is favor to be found in the eyes of the Lord. And in order to find that favor, we have to find ourselves in the will of the Lord. However, the covenant still remains even when we are not in the will of God, that his spirit will not leave us. Sometimes, believe it or not, that spirit of God can be torment. What do you mean? I mean that if we find ourselves in sin, if we find ourselves outside of the will of God, that spirit will come at times and it will torment us to try to bring us back to God. But through it all, that spirit remaineth because the covenant will not fail. We need to hold on to the covenants of God. Turn with me back to Genesis 26 chapter. And this might seem kind of, I guess, shotgunish, but I'm going to bring it to a point 
Lord's help at the end. The 26th chapter of Genesis, starting at the 15th verse, says, For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And they digged another well, and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went from thence to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared unto him in the same night, and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And going down to the 32nd verse, it says that it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well they had digged and said unto him, we have found water. Church, let me tell you today, Isaac had something instilled within him that he had a realization and understanding that before they could go forth, they had to get the water of life. From a medical standpoint, you will not make it very long without water. Brother Chris brought up the Dead Sea this morning in the Sunday school class. A few years ago, I was privileged. Brother Rick and I went together to over to Israel, and we went to the Dead Sea. And I remember we went around, and uh, y'all probably realized by now, going out to eat on Sundays and things, I'm kind of a cheap guy. Uh, I'm going to order water at every restaurant I go to just because I don't want to pay for a drink. I, I find that highway robbery that you're going to charge me $2 for a drink. Uh, so I'll just get the water for free. But we went throughout Israel and we were there for, I think it was about 12 days, wasn't it, Brother Rick? Yeah. 10 days. And the first place we came to was Tiberias. And every time we ate, I got water. We went on, and I can't remember the next place we went to, uh, but we went somewhere else. We stayed. And I got water because it was free. But then we went to the Dead Sea, and we got to the restaurant that night, and we sat down to eat, and I ordered water because it was free. And when I order water, I don't expect my water to have bubbles in it. But I took one big gulp of that water and quickly ordered myself a Coke and it didn't matter the cost to me anymore. Because even though the water did not come directly from the Dead Sea, the water around that area had become so salty and so contaminated that it was disgusting to put it in our mouth. But that whole area I don't know if you remember Brother Rick, but that entire area around the Dead Sea was a dying land. In fact, we saw places that they had built, uh, homes that were constructed, buildings that were erected, that at one time stood at the edge of the water. They were waterfront properties, so they said. But now, and they said they were just built 15, 20 years ago, but now the water was 100, maybe 150 feet away from these buildings because the sea 
was evaporated. The water was leaving. Church, we've got to understand today, if we don't have water, we're going to be in a dead land. If we don't have the water of life, if we don't have that refreshing spirit of God coming and working amongst us, dwelling amongst us, we're going to be in a dry and barren land that will lead us to a place of death. Isaac realized this. So where did Isaac start? Isaac started by going and finding the wells that his father had dug and redigging them. Church, I want to tell you tonight, the church of God is rooted and grounded in the Word of God. That's where it's based out of. That's where it's founded out of. But it's time. It's been 118 years. No, 119 years. Since the arrival of the church of God. Since the church arose this side of the dark ages to carry on the work. I believe somewhere along the lines, the enemy has come in and some of those wells that once provided water have been stopped up. Church, it's time for us as the church today to go back and redig the wells. Yeah. Our forefathers, A.J. Tomlinson, some of those older ministers, they went and they found the life source. They found a revelation that many others, nobody else in that time had. They went and sought something out. And they got a hold of it and carried the vision. Amen. Church, it's not that I want to go back and I want to become A.J. Tomlinson, but I won't think it's time for us to go back and redig until we find the same life source that A.J. Tomlinson found. Amen. It's time for us to go back and start digging again until we find the same revelation that A.J. Tomlinson found. You see, church, we're very privileged and blessed here that we have Brother Lord here with us tonight. And I told Sarah when we left the restaurant this morning, I just love being around Brother Lord. He makes me smile. He gives me joy. But there's wisdom that Brother Art has that I need. There's experiences that Brother Art has been through that I haven't faced yet. Amen. That God has helped him. That God has showed him what to do and the avenue to go down. But you see, as much as I don't want to admit it, there's going to come a day that Brother Art's not going to be here with us anymore. And church, if all we've said and all we've done along the way is say, look at the wisdom that Brother Art has. When that wisdom is no longer here, we're going to find ourselves hurting and lacking. But while I may never experience the exact same things that Brother Art has been to, through, I can go back and I can dig the same wells that Brother Art dug. Amen. And I can find the same life source, that same wisdom, that same strength that he found that helped him Amen. time and time again. Church, it's not just about what has been hundreds of years ago. I'm not trying to bring the past back up. We can't live in the past. We've got to live today. God has given us this day. But what I'm saying is the things of, that our forefathers, the things that our leaders, the things that those that we look to with high esteem and high regard found are still there for us to find today. And the goodness of God, the blessings of God, the strength of God that was enough to 
not enough for me as a pastor of this church, as a young minister, to just look and roll out of my life after Brother Orr and say, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to dig the same things he does. Because God's got something new for us today. He's got a new word. He's got a new me. But it gives me a foundation if I start where he started. And then I go and find a new well. And I keep on digging. There's more for me. Church, we've got to keep on digging. We've got to tap in to the life source. Because without it, we will die. The word remember means to bring to mind or to think of again. To keep in mind for attention or consideration. If you remember after the September 11th attacks, the United States of America adopted a motto. That motto is, we will never forget. Every September 11th, if you're on Facebook, Facebook gets flooded with people saying these words, with people having pictures that have these words posted on them. People around the communities will start putting up signs that will say, we will never forget. Church, if the country of the United States of America will feel that way, if they can feel that way so much so that they're saying, we will never forget the attack that came to our land. We will never forget and let our borders be that subjected again. How much more so should we be saying, we will never forget what God has done for us in the past. We will never forget the attacks that the enemy has brought, but God has delivered us through. That he's given us the victory to get past those things. That he's given us the strength and the wisdom to keep moving forward. To not forget is to remember. It's to keep it on our minds. But it's not just there to waste time. It's not just there to take up space. But it's there, as the definition says, to keep in mind for attention or consideration. Church, we need to be given some attention to the things that God has done for us. To the things that God has brought us through. Because when we start giving attention to those things, the trials that we're facing, the hard times that we're going through right now, don't seem so bad anymore. Because we remember what God brought us through already. If Isaac felt it important to go back and to start over again where his father began and redig the wells, should we also not feel the importance today to go back to the beginning and start again? That's not to give up ground, but that's to say there's a foundation that we can go back to and build upon. Over and over and over again. Amen. You see, if you're a builder, Brother Rick is an electrician. He does a lot of work with construction. I've been in enough construction projects, worked in enough homes, done enough handyman jobs to know that if the foundation is strong, you can tear the whole house down and rebuild on that same foundation over again. And it'll stay. Church, the foundation has not weakened. The foundation has not got cracks in it. It's not got blown away. We look at that parking lot over at General Headquarters, and there's cracks running all through it. 
There are big holes in it. There's if you drive through it, you're going to bounce all along the way because there's big holes and ruts in it. That's not the foundation of the church of God. But Brother Christopher, I don't like some of the things I'm seeing. Well, just to be perfectly honest, I don't like some of the things I'm seeing either. But it's not because the foundation's wrong. It's because the things that have been built on top of the foundation aren't holding, aren't standing the test of time, aren't weathering the storms that come this way. The foundation is still strong. But where do we begin? I'm not just here to preach a generalized message to say this is what the church needs to do. We're here tonight to get ministered to and to encourage ourselves and to make a difference in our lives. So where do we begin at in the church of God? We can say we begin at salvation, but that's not the beginning for us in the church of God. Salvation is the beginning for us in the kingdom of God. He brings us into the kingdom when we get saved. If we're going to start in the church of God, it starts with us laying our hand on a Bible. And it starts with us taking a covenant. Remember, I started this message with saying that a covenant, no matter the conditions, no matter what happens, no matter what I do in my life, no matter what you do in your life, the covenant remains. Church, that's the foundation that you and I as members of this body have to work on. Is the fact that we took a covenant and said that we agreed to take the whole Bible rightly divided. Not just this verse here and this verse there, but the entire Bible as the Word of God. Amen. In fact, the covenant says, will you sincerely promise in the presence of God and these witnesses that you will accept this Bible as the Word of God, believe and practice its teachings, Rightly divided. The New Testament as your rule of faith and practice. Government and discipline. And walk in the light to the best of your knowledge and ability. As far as I know, with the exception of Sam, every single one of us in here tonight has laid our hand on that Bible. And that's been read to us. And we responded by saying, I will. Church, there's not a single person that forced you to say those words. But of your own choice, you entered yourself into a covenant to take the whole Bible. No matter come what may, no matter what things we go through, no matter what those around us may do, we took a covenant to take the entire Bible as the Word of God. Church, Brother Rick had one of these and this afternoon and gave it out. I'm thankful that he has a desire to share the Word of God. Something I need to get better about. But this 29 teachings track is not what you covenanted yourself to. Believe it or not, This advice to members track is not what you covenanted yourself to. You laid your hand on this Bible. And the Word of God is what you covenanted yourself to. I was talking with somebody a couple years ago. This individual, when the reorganization took place in 93, didn't come over immediately. In fact, I think it was about 2003, 2004 before they came over. But I just asked him, what was it that made you wait? Why didn't you come over immediately? Why didn't you feel like that was the right choice? 
And the person told me was it took me a long time to realize I did not covenant myself to the name of the church without prophecy. But I coveted myself to the word of God and to God. Amen. Church, let me tell you something today. We are members of the church of God as the organization. But the covenant we took was not just between the organization and us. The covenant we took was between us and God. Yeah. It was between us and the word of God. Amen. We've got to hold on to God Amen. because that's who our covenant's with. Right. We've got to hold on to the word of God because that's where our covenant lies. That's the foundation that we built on. Right. That's what it started out as, is taking a covenant with the word of God and building from that point forward. Somebody asked a question not too long ago. If A.J. Tomlinson were to look at the church today, would he recognize her anymore? I don't feel the need to comment on that. But what I do feel the need to comment on is I want you to remember what you covenanted yourself to. Yes. What I do feel the need to comment on is I want you to think back about the condition of the church when you laid your hand on that Bible. And I want you to think about where she was then. And I want you to look to now. And I want to ask you the question, do you recognize the church that you took a covenant with? One time I preached a message. That message was entitled, Look at Where She's Come. When I preached this message, we had just, it was our first Sunday in a new church at Covington. We had done a lot of work to it. And we had someone that had been in the community for a long period of time come by on a Thursday while I was working at the church. And he asked if he could just walk in and see the work that we had done. So I led him into the church. And he just looked at me with big tears in his eyes, and he said, look at where she's come. She looked so good. That church had fallen in disrepair. It had gotten to a state that for some time there was nobody using that building. For about five years, seven years, I think it was, there was nobody in and out of that building. There was no heat. There was no air. The elements, nature had taken a toll on that building. There has been, there have been mold that had grown in the basement of that building. Things had started to fall apart. And this is what the community remembered about that building. But he came and he looked at it and he said, look at where she's come to now. And there was an excitement and there was a joy that came over him because he knew things had progressed. Things had gotten better. But I followed that up by saying there have been times in my life where I have made the statement, look at where she's come. And it has not been a time of joy. I've looked around at the things and seen things not going the way I want. And I'm not even talking about the church necessarily. But I remember having tools one time I bought a uh, golf cart. Thought I got a really good deal on that. Let me tell you something. If you find something that's too good of a deal to be true, probably it probably is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I bought a golf cart. And I thought for sure, the person that sold it to me said, I don't, I don't know if it really runs or not. It ran the last time I tried to use it. So I said, well, it'll be fine. It ain't no big deal. Probably just needs a battery. Well, even this dumb old boy here can change a battery out. So I went and bought a battery. Put a battery in it. Guess what? It still didn't run. And I worked and I worked and had a really, really close friend that came and 
held me and we started taking apart everything. We took apart the carburetor. And we took, we drained out the gas tank and we did this. We cleaned the fuel filter. We cleaned everything we could find, the air filter. We went through. And over time, eventually, when all was that was left was to take the engine out and change it out. And I said, I'm not doing that. We finally got it running again. But I remember along that process, I looked and I said, man, look at where she's coming. I poured all this money in. I poured all this work into it. And it's still not running. It wasn't favorable. Church, I want to ask you the question today. Look at where she's coming. Do you recognize her? Is she where is she where you think she should be? More importantly than that, is she where the word of God tells us we should be? And if your answer to that is no, what are you doing to change that? The definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Not wrong. <laughs> but church, how many times are we coming to church and doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result? If we're going to see a different result, it's going to be because we're somewhere along the line did something differently. It's because somewhere along the line we got a deeper relationship with God. Because somewhere along the line we got serious about things and wouldn't take no for an answer. We've heard the term many times that someone renewed their covenant. The word renew or the renew means to begin or take up again. To make effective for an additional period. To restore or replenish. Tonight, I want to take some time. And I want us to go before the Lord. And I want us to ask him to renew within us that covenant that we took. Amen. Church, I don't know about you. I took the covenant in 2003. My grandpa was the pastor at Lynchburg, Virginia Church at that point. And I had been willing to take the covenant for about six months and join the church. But my grandpa wanted to be the one to take me in. And I wanted him to be the one to take me in. So we worked and we worked and we worked. And finally, our schedules got together. And I was able to go and be with him in a revival service. And he took me into the church. And I remember the excitement that came over me that night. Because I was so happy just to be a member of the church of God. I knew it was the bride of Christ. I knew what God had shown me, what he had revealed to me. And I knew what I was supposed to do. And there was an excitement and a joy that came because I was obedient to God, because I took the covenant. But church, I can also tell you, in my own lifetime, there have been multiple times, multiple scenarios, where that excitement was not the same. Where I looked around and I saw the condition she was in, and excitement was not at all the word that I would have used to describe what I was feeling. Amen. Distress, hurt, anger. But church today, we need a relationship.
renewed excitement to be members of the church of God. Amen. Is that going to mean everything is going to be perfect overnight? It's not going to happen. I'm just going to be honest with you. But it means that if we'll go back to the foundation and we'll begin to build again, the blemishes, the problems that we have now will wipe out when we tear them away. And the foundation is still standing firm. The excitement that we once had can come back. And church, I believe with all my heart, it's going to take some excitement to get this work done. If we're down in the mullet grubs, if we're saying, woe is me, woe is me, throwing ourselves a pity party, guess what? Nobody else is going to want to come be with us. But if we'll get a hold of an excitement because we have a renewal inside of us that brings back to our mind again for attention that we joined ourselves to the bride of Christ, not to another, we can see a difference. Stand with me if you would. In the second message that was leading up to the call for the Solemn Assembly in 1993, the Holy Ghost said, For indeed, indeed, my people, I am moving in the midst of the church. Yea, I am disappointed. I am very disappointed. Lo, I tell you, my people are sitting in places of death, and they refuse to come out. Brother Lofton went on to write in the book of Remembrance, the second message spoke about places of death which the people were sitting in. This refers to the dry, formal atmosphere which permeated most of our churches at that time. If the Holy Ghost were to give us a report of the church today what would it be would it be that his people are sitting in places of death would it be that we're sitting in dry formal places see the Holy Ghost said he was disappointed I don't believe he was so much disappointed at the fact that the people were in these places as much as he was disappointed at the fact that he said they refused to come out. Church of God, here at Southside, today, we need to come out of the dead places, of the dry formal atmosphere that has permeated the church. And we need to see an excitement renewed in us that we can carry on the work in the days ahead. That we can remember those words will you sincerely promise is the covenant we took. Tonight I want us to find a place to pray. I want us to look to the Lord. If we have to tear down the walls, if we have to tear off the roof and go back to where it's just the foundation that we placed our hand on the Bible and we made a covenant with God. So be it. But we need to go back and we need to renew within us the excitement, the encouragement, the fervency to be a part of the church of God again. Let's find a place to pray. Let's call out to the Lord here tonight.